Hi everyone. Welcome to our fifth edition of Notes, Art and Tech Encounters. I'm Noemi Jangiro, director of the Goethe Institute San Francisco and member of the unique cluster Silicon Valley. Thrilled you're joining us today. Hi. So Notes, Art and Tech Encounters is a series of talk that talks that supports the exchange of artists, technologists and researchers from the US and Europe. The panel series was established within the Unicluster Silicon Valley, which is a network of European diplomatic and cultural institutions working with local partners in the Bay Area and beyond. Through projects like Nodes, but also Grid Exposure, Art Tech and Policy Days, we interrogate intersections and new and old ways of collaboration between art and tech. If you would like to find out more, please visit us on getonthegrid.org. How can we make current and future technologies more just, more inclusive? How can we counteract the technological systematization of biases already embedded in our societies? What role can art play in this process? Today, our wonderful lineup of experts from Germany and the US will discuss philosophical and ethical questions that modern technology face, uh, forces us to face. I encourage you to not just watch and listen to our experts, but to join, interact and engage with your own thoughts and questions. Technologist, artist, hacker, activist, feminist, archaeologist, just some of the titles I could use to describe our amazing lineup today. Before we get to them, let me just briefly introduce to you our fantastic moderator of Nodes, Art and Tech Encounters, Marnie Benny. Marnie is an independent curator working at the intersection of contemporary art and technology. Over the last decade, she has produced over uh, almost 30 exhibitions in city centers, public spaces, galleries, festivals around the world. Benny's works investigate the societal, cultural, and future implications of technology through the lens of contemporary art. Last year, she has founded AIArtist.org. It's the world's largest community of artists using artificial intelligence, where she serves as curator and provides a platform for artists to explore the future implications of AI on society. Marnie, the stage is yours. Thank you so much. Thanks, Noemi. Thank you for inviting us here today. And a huge thank you to the Goethe Institute for providing a platform for this discussion about art and technology. Today, we're focusing on how AI, machine learning, and other technologies are, are scaling up the biases and inequalities that, embed, that are embedded in our societies. We will also discuss methodologies in creating more holistic, equitable, and sustainable technologies of the future. First, I'll briefly introduce each panelist, and then I will let them further introduce themselves and the projects that they're working on in short presentations. And then after that, we'll have our panel discussion. And then at the last 10 minutes or so, um, we will have questions. And during the panel uh, and the event, feel free to add your questions in, in the Q&A uh, boxes. And, um, during this event, when the artists and the panelists are presenting, um, if you would like to see their face as they're presenting, because they'll share their whole screen, um, there is a view uh, button up at the top uh, right hand side of your um, Zoom, and you just press view and you can select side by side mode if it isn't already selected. So first, I will get started with the panelists introductions. So Weena Lin is a Brooklyn-based futurist, fine artist, and creative director. She creates sensory experiences in physical and digital spaces by extending the expressiveness of traditional art and design mediums using technology. She has created experiences for Intel, IBM, Microsoft, Samsung, and Google, just to name a few. As a fine artist, she explores themes of imperialism, the singularity, environmental sustainability, and spirituality. She has exhibited internationally with institutions, including the Smithsonian Museum and the Himalayans Museum. Eliza Lindener is joining us from Berlin, and she is co-founder of Superlab, which aims to promote a more equitable future through technological foresight and shaping new narratives. She works at the intersection of technology, art, and the humanities. And her research and activism focuses on open digital infrastructure communities, 
digital civic society, and the social impact of emerging technologies. And Matt Mitchell, finally, our third panelist, Matt Mitchell is a hacker and tech fellow at the Ford Foundation. Matt is working with the build and, technolo and technology and society teams at the Ford Foundation to develop digital security strategy, technical assistance, and security measures for the foundation's grantee partners. He has been listed by Vice's motherboard as, human of the, as a human of the year for his work protecting marginalized communities from surveillance. Matt has also found, founded and leads Crypto Harlem, which hosts impromptu workshops teach, teaching basic cryptography tools to the predominantly African-American community in Upper Manhattan. Matt also is a tech advisor to the Human Rights Foundation and is an advisory board member at the Open Technology Fund and the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers and the Internet Freedom Festival. So now I'm going to hand it over to Weena so she can tell you a little bit more about her work and the projects that she's worked on. Hi, thanks so much for having me today. It is a true honor to be on this panel, um, which Marnie has put together with uh, Matt Mitchell and my new friend Elisa as well. Um, uh, so I wanted to tell you a bit about my practice and, uh, and then, uh, that could set the stage for how, uh, you know, the work of a creative director in advertising, um, relates to, uh, um, technology and also to AI. All right. This is kind of an example of what I would do typically in advertising, um, where we'd take a product and use emerging technology, including, um, Algorithmic video capture, we build custom software, generative graphics, um, and uh, kind of meld all of that into a seamless user experience, uh, which usually has some sort of an output for sharing. Uh, up until recently, a lot of these experiences were in the built environment, um, but of course, with COVID, uh, you know, the uh, experienced designers of the world have had to kind of pivot and we're now looking at creating um, digital platforms more often than we are experiences in the real world. Um, so having familiar familiarity with technology such as sensor capture and um, you know cloud storage, processing data, um, creating generative graphics and uh, doing all of that with the uh, consumer in mind has put us in a position, put, um, you know, creative directors and other um, creatives who work in advertising and in technology, um, that's put us in the position of being great collaborators with technologists and engineers. So uh, one of the companies that I've worked for in the past is IBM, where, we've, uh, where I was able to collaborate with Dario Gill, who's the head of research at IBM, about um, portraying what contemporary computing looks like. This is a video that we had worked on to um, portray what classic computing, what neural nets, and then what quantum computing might look like. So here we're actually uh, collaborating with researchers to express really abstract technical concepts in a way that's simple enough for consumers to understand. Um, that's given me unprecedented access to really learn about technology from the researchers themselves. Like in this project, I was able to work not only with Dario, but also um, with uh, the uh, head of Watson, um, and other researchers who are building uh, uh, platforms or uh, focusing on inclusion in AI. And, um, you know, that's all in addition to thinking about the hardware. So that's been a really amazing experience. With IBM, we were also working with the researchers who were thinking about how AI is impacting employment to process their data and tell stories about uh, which jobs might be more secure in the future as AI becomes more incorporated into the workplace. Um, so we were able to here, like process Python data and create visualizations that enable researchers to glean new insights that they wouldn't otherwise be able to with their, you know, epic amounts of data. And um, we do so with the consumer in mind, because at the end of the day, um, there needs to be uh, communication with the average person about why AI is relevant, um, especially in terms of getting buy-in and um, 
applying AI more widely. And so thinking about how that technology scales has really impacted my own personal art practice, um, where I think about not only technology and its uh, most progressive uh, implementations, but also the end of life cycle of technology. Um, so this research led me to find out about e-waste and the e-waste life cycle where our um, hardware basically goes to die in developing nations where labor is cheap and environmental regulations are super, super lax. Um, you have really the poorest of the poor, usually like, you know, orphans uh, in um, uh, villages which have the most uh, decimated environment processing electronic waste to reclaim scrap metal and scrap materials. Um, here's an example. So this is in um, one of the largest e-waste villages in the world, which is in Ghana. Um, they're also, up until maybe two years ago, they were processing a lot of electronic waste in China. And so here's an example of how um, gold might be reclaimed from old uh, PCBs. Um, and this is what the environment looks like afterwards. And so this research led me to think about not only, you know, the uh, birthplace of our electronics, but also uh, where they go to die. And from that, I created an in immersive installation, um, which is, you know, it takes the platform that I've established um, in advertising and that kind of uh, understanding of how to create conversion amongst consumers, how to get consumers to um, buy into an idea or to buy a concept or to buy a product. And here I'm selling the concept of, um, you know, be being more involved in activism. So, um, you know, this installation is a participatory space where um, individuals sit down, disassemble electronic waste um, in the same context that they might reassemble or build a iPhone um, in a Foxconn factory. And as they disassemble the electronic waste, they actually watch videos of other people disassembling electronic waste, except in, um, you know, really poor conditions, um, as shown in the images uh, that I had uh, in the presentation earlier. So I've been able to tour this installation, which is called Disassembly, internationally. And this is a photo from... Uh, the disassembly presentation in China, where people actually saw videos of um, people who, other Chinese people who were probably just, you know, a hundred miles away or so disassembling electronic waste. Um, and so that connection builds empathy. And also, um, you know, we're finding that different modes of engaging um, with a population that has a lot of neurodiversity um, has wide impacts that might not necessarily be possible just by teaching people through conventional means. Um, and so uh, at this moment, I'm actually working on a number of platforms which engage people. Um, they're, all, they're all virtual platforms, but they're engaging uh, people in arts uh, using machine learning and other algorithmic processes. And so um, the learnings that I have gleaned from my art practice have had enormous impact on how I'm approaching inclusion and machine learning in my professional practice. Great, thank you so much. And then I'm just sort of gonna pass the baton over here um, to Elisa. Uh, yeah, hi everyone. My name is Elisa Lininger. I'm joining you today from Berlin where it's already dark outside and pretty cold. So um, greetings from around the globe. Uh, I'm a researcher and I'm also the archaeologist that was mentioned in the introduction. So um, spoilers here. Um, but for the past, well, almost 15 years, I've been working at the intersection of the humanities, arts, technology and society. I'm of, I've also been an open source advocate and uh, yeah, uh, I still am. I'm here today on behalf of the SUCO community, which um, is a community of women, trans folks, and non-binary people who also work in a similar field as I do uh, in the arts and technology, who work as journalists, who are activists, um, or work in science or academia. And this uh, community was founded in uh, 2015 um, by Julia Kleuber and Sarah Rahman, for those who know them. And uh, when I joined, I realized that 
many stories centered about founding your own company or your own organization, but the stories behind those were quite different from the typical like startup stories that you hear usually in the tech field. It was more about finding a space to pursue your own ideas or creating a space where your visions are actually heard and esteemed valuable because the people that were part of the community often were like in the day job um, part of a broader group and they had a for example a feminist um, approach or an, an intersectional approach um, an approach of empowerment and they didn't find a space where that was heard or that was considered feasible and in the end we followed the example of many of the people in our community and we founded our own space to pursue our own ideas which is not the super community but super lab which i founded last year with uh, julia kleuber and the idea behind super is exactly that thing um, to on the one hand make it possible for more people to pursue their ideas because especially in tech because we believe that this discussion and the debates about technology need more diverse voices from uh, people around the globe from people with different sets of abilities or disabilities and um, from people with different class backgrounds and whatever you can think of so um, this is the way that yeah the idea that we set out with and what we're currently working on our work um, is quite diverse, I would say. We uh, do research projects. Uh, on the one hand, we do advocacy. Uh, we also do lots of events. Um, let me just quickly uh, run you down one project because it touches upon the subject of AI that we just finished up with. I don't have a slide for that because it was a very boring report and I don't want to send you all to sleep by just putting in a screenshot here. Um, it was a report that looked at software products that are used in recruiting and HR that claim to have artificial intelligence in them. Of course, it's very hard to look inside like a broad range of products and uh, check out the algorithms that are at work. Um, but we looked at just the, the marketing promises and those were actually pretty scary. And to be honest, I hope that many of these projects do not have AI in them and are basically not more than snake oil because there, in, in many of them, there was the propensity for discrimination in the workplace. And this is what our report focused on. How can we, um, what, what kind of uh, ramifications do we need to make sure that the software that is already being used in this yeah, highly regulated field, at least in Europe, highly regulated field of recruiting and, uh, and HR, how can we make sure that this new generation of products follows these rules and abides by these rules? I also already said that we also do advocacy. This is one thing, uh, an initiative that we started on the 1st of April um, that was not intended. Um, it was called Learning from the Crisis, Empower Civil Society Organizations. Um, it's about the accelerated digital turn that I think the entire world is taking in course of the global pandemic when everything like we today are turning to Zoom and all these platforms and the loss of unsurveilled civic spaces that goes with this digitization. And we also try to formulate recommendations for policymakers, what they can do on their behalf um, to yeah, strengthen digital civil society and their free spaces uh, for exchange and without government or without um, corporate interference. And um, we also do events, I already said that, so let me quickly drop that here. This is an event we're doing with the Goethe Institute uh, next Friday. It's a, a panel discussion with activists from around the world who look at uh, our future in the times of crises, because we have several going on right now from the climate crisis to the pandemic. And there will be people from Hong Kong speaking, from, um, from Belarus, from Venezuela and from Berlin and uh, Lebanon. And I think it's going to be a very interesting panel where we talk about how technology helps us keep hope in these very trying times. And um, this is a, a, a sneak preview that I'm, I'm giving you today. This is our project that we're going to launch next week um, because it's not only about us dominating the discourse. We, as I said, we believe that uh, we need to bring more voices to the table. Um, we are launching, together with the German Foundation, the Berkeley Bertelsmann Stiftung, we are launching a program and a fellowship that's called The New New. 
um, with which you want to enable people who are already active in shaping new visions about society and technology throughout Europe to take basically um, half a year to pursue these ideas, take them to the next level and work stronger uh, with their communities and strengthen the ties um, to, in the end, create these narratives about a variety of futures that are actually worth working towards and fighting for. Because I think these empowering narratives are what we need right now. And with that, I'll hand back over to Marnie. Great, thank you so much. Um, and Elisa, could you just uh, put in the information in the chat for the event that's gonna happen uh, on Friday that you were mentioning? Sure. Um, okay, great, thanks so much. Um, and Matt, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Okay, great. I can't wait to check out some of those events. The new new looks really exciting, as well as this future in crisis. Um, yeah, I thought I'd do something a little bit different. So I'm going to show a video on what I do because it's very much communities involved things and try to bring the community to you. When I talk to you about surveillance, there's this kind of like, why well, I don't have anything to hide. I never get that when I'm talking to this community. You can't buy a bag of chips in Harlem without being surveilled. A crypto party is an event where people get together to talk about digital surveillance, digital safety, and what they can do to uh, be safe or mitigate risk. Crypto Harlem is open for all people. All people are welcome. But Crypto Harlem is here for a reason. It's for Black people in Harlem who are over-policed and uh, heavily surveilled. And this is a safe space for us all to learn together and want something to learn from each other. Harlem is like a cultural hub. It's really important to highlight it, like where it's been and where it's going. Including tech in that conversation is just important about making sure that we can progress. Like it's about disruption. One thing that I do is I spend a lot of time looking at current events in information security, cyber, and I ask myself like, how does this story affect people on the ground in Harlem right now? So I'll walk around for three hours, just handing out flyers, talking to people in the community, promoting the event, um, because you know, you're not gonna get the best people and a, a good representation of the community by posting it on Meetup or, or Twitter. That's just not reality. You need to go to the barber shops, you need to go to the hair salons, you need to talk to the pastor of that church and the imam of that mosque and really get down with the people. Can I give you this? It's a free class that we do right down around the corner over there. Yeah. It's about computer security, it's like family friendly, it talks about surveillance and a lot of other issues. In New York City, especially in communities like Bronx and Harlem, we have this thing called stop and frisk. It's like very aggressive and it's dehumanizing. But there's a new practice, which is like the digital version of it, which is probably more dangerous. What we see with this kind of digital world of stop and frisk are young folks who are told by YouTube and Twitter, and Facebook, be yourself, express yourself, tell us your stories and present them here. And those stories are being turned against them. If there is any criminal act or an act of violence by one person, and that person's associated with you or associated with your crew, you'll get taken down. A lot of people understand this idea of like six degrees of separation, but when you're a person of color, it's like two. These kind of stories we need to pick them up, we need to raise them up, we need to address them and solve them ourselves because no one else will. If you can hear the sound of my voice, just clap your hands three times. Okay, we're starting back. Black folks have been surveilled since the very beginning, since we landed here on slave ships, right? So um, you're a number. They're just like slave number 10, walked over here, walked over there, drank some water, did this. That situation, has followed us, but hasn't changed that much. Technology will just make things harder to see. So what Matt does with these crypto parties is he'll bring, he'll bring a different topic each time he comes in. It's about exposing them to a lot of different pieces of information, but it's also about equipping you with that knowledge and then moving forward on your own. When we have these surveillance talks, I tend to see morality going down. And I would like to see morality going up. So if we can share more tools that organizers should be using today, even if you can name one or two, I would love to know.
I think he does a really good job of then trying to encourage you to take control of whether it's your privacy or it's learning about blockchain or it's learning about Bitcoin. Like he really tries to empower people. Thank you. Okay. What about at a, a protest? So New York City was like, we're going to try to set the rules where we'll turn off the cameras at a protest so you're not being you know, shown like, okay, I'm this person, I'm against this thing. But the cameras are moving faster than the regulations are because law doesn't move that quickly. I think that it's for us as citizens to get a little more involved in these policies and issues so we can help steer them. People are hungry for this. And there's so many community leaders who are already here and coming into a room like this just kind of gives you an affirmation. Like, yes, we're on the right path. I'm a hacker, but I'm black first. And when you see me a block away, you know I'm black. You don't know I'm a hacker. One thing that I hope to get out of this event is creating more black hackers, creating more black people in cyber, creating more black people in infosec, because it's a space where there are more positions than people. So I want to see more of myself in the, in the work that I, I work in. People say this is the next frontier of civil rights, and it's a statement that I agree with. Boom. I just see a change in Whoa. the way that we... Okay, sorry about that. Just making sure you're listening and watching. So, um, <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's, that's what I do. I mean, obviously, real talk because of COVID-19, which has heavily impacted the city of New York, the United States, and, um, you know, black and brown folks are dying at three times the number. So, you know, now we do the event on um, like platforms like this, like Zoom. It's virtual. We do it once a month and we're still meeting. So thank you, Marnie. Back to you. Yeah, that's great. Wow. Thank you guys so much. I mean, just such an amazing um, group doing amazing things. And each of you guys have such a, a interesting perspective on, you know, technology. Um, and I just want to talk a, a little bit about human rights, because I feel like everyone's work really kind of comes down to that, whether it's um, the environment, whether it's surveillance, whether it's um, having a voice, having a platform, um, open, you know, digital communities and and um, you know, civic rules. I'm wondering if sort of each person can give their perspective a little bit more on um, why that's so important and why it's important to sort of have a inclusive sort of holistic perspectives when people are thinking about um, technologies and all the different ways that, they're, that they may be thinking about them, especially, you know, tech companies. Who do you want to go for? Mm, let's, uh, Matt, do you want to go first? I mean, I, I don't like going first, but I, I, I'll just quickly jump <laughs> in. But I mean, first of all, what a panel. I mean, I'm, my mind is blown being on this panel. Um, for me, human rights are important when it comes to technology, as so, so is inclusion. And it really, you know, I, I use this example of um, in New York, in the United States is American Bar Association. And if you wanna be a barrister, you wanna be a lawyer, you have to pass this bar exam. Well, because of COVID-19, they can't have the test in these facilities. So you have to take it at your desk in your home. And uh, what happens to a bunch of black folks who went to law school and are trying to become lawyers, did all that stuff. When they try to take the exam, the detection on whether you're cheating technology cannot see their faces literally says you must stand in front of the screen, you cannot leave the room or you will fail this test. So when they call tech support, they're told shine a light in your face. Take a lamp and just shine it in your face as you take this test. And it's the only way for you to do it. And you know, like, how did this happen? I mean, obviously there was no black person on the team building that tool because it would have been like, hey, uh, I came in for the nine o'clock morning meeting and it can't see me, you know, like, so how do we get to a point where this technology is out and deployed and delivered but there are people in the, in the world who it does not work for or it has harms that, happen, that happens to. And what I would say is marginalized people, queer folk, black folks, uh, you know, all different types of marginalized communities around the world are the ones who are living in a dystopian future, feeling the negative impacts of a lot of the tech that we roll out. And not, you know, the harms there are the technology doesn't work. You can't market, you can't sell it, you can't use it to these people. And, it's harmful to us. It's actually creating negative things. No developer wants like, you know, cyber blood on their hands. So at the end of the day, it's not just the right thing to do, but it's important. Otherwise you're creating two worlds and one that leaves most of the world behind. And that's not a future that I want to be involved in. 
Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, I mean, it's, I, I think that one of the issues is that oftentimes, you know, people who get into engineering and people who build platforms are really excited about problem solving. And that problem might be a problem of ones and zeros. But oftentimes, I think that it's hard to have both the interests of, you know, solving problems in engineering in mind alongside solving the human problem and thinking about the human touch points. And so even if you think about like your users, you might only be thinking about a small community of your users and not this you know, like more diverse um, community, which will eventually adopt your platform because it might be folded into other technologies that become more ubiquitous. At the same time, you know, you have this notion of global social justice where like, you know, there everything has a footprint. So in addition to thinking about literally the users of your platforms, you know, there, there are the people who will end up touching the hardware that you create and that cre- there's an inequity there as well. I, you know, I think it, the you know the focus of this um, talk I think will lean much more heavily towards inclusion in terms of the users of the platform, um, but I do think that there is this additional kernel, which is that you know every technology that we build has a footprint, and and in terms of global social justice, the people who suffer from that footprint are not the people who created the technology, and oftentimes are not the people who use the technology either. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I can only agree with what uh, Wina and Matt just said. So I think it's worth looking at like where that comes from. And I think it's about the stories we like to tell ourselves, but that are fundamentally wrong. For example, that the story, the, the story that the internet was created as an open thing. It was a number of nodes that wasn't controlled by academia, by corporations and by the military in the United States. This is not an open network. And this has continued for the past decades. If you look at even how the, the submarine cables uh, connect the world and which nodes they go through, this is a perpetuation of colonialism. It's fundamentally unjust and we need to address this in order to be able yeah, to, to start having uh, uh, just digitization and living in a just digital world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, completely agreed. And to sort of piggyback on that idea and to talk just a little bit about the differences based where you are. So, um, Elisa, you were mentioning in your talk, you know, Europe, there's rules, um, but in the States, there's not as many rules. I'm, I'm hoping that we can have a little bit of a discussion about, about that as well um, and how the, you know, the U.S. is, I think, I mean, my personal opinion, very far behind on the sort of, um, you know, uh, rights for people and privacy laws and all of these um, things. And and now we're sort of just starting to get there. You know, Congress is, you know, trying to meet with the tech companies and understand what they even mean. Um, so that we have a big sort of um, gap in there, I think, education as well. So I'm just wondering, so, you know, for the people in the audience, you know, the technologists um, and, and the artists, can you share a little bit of insight of what you think might be helpful if a company is sort of starting to think about that or the United S- helpful steps that, you know, people in the U.S. Um, could start taking? Um, yes, of course. I mean, um, it, it's not, it's not an easy undertaking, but and, who can do yeah. it if not the, if not the largest, um, uh, organizations in the world and the richest. So I believe it's really fundamental to, um, look at cultural practices, but also legal practices in other fields before you design your product and take into account what, uh, what the, what the legal frameworks are and abide to those. I mean, we have GDPR in Europe to, um, leverage a little bit of the power of this economic entity in the European Union, but this has led to this army of cookie notifications that pop up now everywhere over the internet. And um, yeah, I believe we need more of a global dialogue. Um, it, it, I think it can't be just to the EU trying to pass some legislation to fix the whole problem. I think what we really need is a global dialogue and some sort of honest commitment by corporations to, um, yeah, to build with their users and for their users and not just um Mm -hmm. yeah i think that's great i think that's great advice and great perspective um matt or weena do you have any thoughts on that yeah i mean i think that uh oftentimes um 
as an advertising agency, for example, building a platform using the latest technology to then create ads for that technology, we come across a lot of the um, shortcomings of the tech itself. And um, oftentimes there's not budget built into the project to actually solve those problems. And, you know, like as an example, like, and, and, you know, this kind of uh, dovetails into what Matt was saying, like computer vision is pretty bad. And like, you know, just having a slightly more diverse team in advertising agency, like we discover that it can't see certain things, like it can't see darker skin, it can't see black hair. Um, and, and so this really, you know, tracks back to having diverse hiring practices, like these problems would have been addressed much earlier if you know, the, the foundation has been established for people in diverse communities to learn engineering, to be hired, um, to help with R&D, even, you know, user testing in a company like that should happen before the product rolls out. And there should be, um, you know, every step of the way, there should be budget built in for user testing because we can, you know, also surface those issues. But oftentimes, you know, we kind of have to just dumb down the technology because there's not enough. Uh, attention. There aren't enough stakeholders who care about this kind of a thing. Um, there's not enough budget to incorporate and tell that story uh, or improve the product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, we look at Germany's GDPR regulation, right? We look at California, you know, probably the United States, you could look at the COVID response, right? You have 50 independent governments doing 50 independent things. So in California, we have a Consumer Privacy Act, right? That's looking like a US version of GDPR on an attempt. We have the same thing in Delaware, we have the same thing in Utah, we have people in Oakland uh, and in other parts of the United States banning uh, facial recognition cameras, but it's piecemeal because we don't have a national law on this right now. And then we look at the companies and the companies are making money hand over fist. They don't care about us. So the solution is, you know, you want to get rid of all the misogyny and sexism and ways that the technology is hurting women, right? Uh, well, have some women make that technology. They're not going to build in harms for themselves, right? Uh, people will say, oh, Matt, it's going to cost so much for me to make this, this technology woke and have it not hurt black folks. Well, maybe have some black folks build that technology. Like, we make stuff too. Saying we're not going to make it that hurts our community. So at the end of the day, this is why diversity and inclusion is so important because it builds in built-in protections everywhere. Because communities like trans folks aren't gonna build tech that hurts trans folks, right? So if you don't have a, anyone who's trans in your entire organization, well, maybe you don't need to be an organization anymore. So, so that's my viewpoint on, on that. That's great. This is great. Thank you. Um, Matt, I'm hoping that you can share a little bit about the work that you do at the Ford Foundation, because I think it kind of dovetails in with this idea of what we kind of are doing in the U.S. and in, in a different realm, but um, especially the build and the technology and society um, uh, sectors or departments over there. Yeah, totally. So, you know, Ford Foundation is an old institutional philanthropy, still around, still kicking, right? And, um, you know, Ford realizes that maybe we need to do things differently. Maybe we should challenge ourselves. And, you know, BUILD is looking at the current state of people who are helping us on our mission, our number one mission, which is fighting inequality on this planet, right? Small goal, right? And, um, you know, the grantee partners, the organizations, NGOs and nonprofits, they're the ones doing this great work. And uh, maybe we should change the way that we look at them and change the way we fund them and builds as an experiment to say, maybe we need to look at how to turn you into an org from an organization into an institution that lives beyond your lifespan. You know, in the US, there's organizations like the ACLU and NAACP that have been around for a long time. Well, we know what it takes to be those orgs. We support those orgs and always have, right? And the people who were working there before me and people who worked there after me. So let's share some of that knowledge and also dig deep and give multi-year funding. And that means capacity building and support in areas like human resources, communication, financial resiliency, and of course, cybersecurity. And that's what I'm doing is building tools and, and, and ways to assess and measure and support those groups. And one of them actually dropped today, you know, saving it for this event. And uh, I'll put it in the chat, but it's, it's called the uh, Cybersecurity Assessment Tool. And if you just go to Ford Foundation and you look at the build program, you'll see it there. I'll put the link out here. And it's for our build grantees 
to assess their cybersecurity, find their gaps, find their weaknesses, figure out what to do next, but it's on an open public website for any organization to use. And those are the kind of things that I'm building out there. And tech and society is just looking at, we understand that technology has a, a unique and powerful effect on society. And we have regional offices, we have programs in our areas, but technology is everywhere and it's nowhere at the same time. And that program is specialists and experts looking at how we can support open infrastructure that's not based on this colonialism, that's not based on this uh, war mongering, that's not based on harms. That's uh, the, the internet that we think and that we hope for. How do we make that more true? And tech and society tackles that problem. So thanks for giving me a moment to talk about that. Yeah, that's great. Oh, I'm excited. Thank you. Thanks for get, waiting for the big reveal for today. This is great. Weena, so I, the, I was going to also ask you, could you uh, just give a little light to, um, you know, the, the bigger tech organizations that you're, you, you know, that you've worked with, you know, um, Intel, IBM, Google, do you see them being this being important for them? Do you see, um, you know, inclusivity or do you, or what steps do you see it? Well, yeah, do you see them actually realizing it in the first place? And then what do they, are they doing anything about it? And do you think it's like authentic what they're doing or is it, you know, I don't, I don't want to lead the, yeah, I mean, lead, lead it's, the it's, here, it's definitely tricky. I think that, um, you know, within these organizations, there are so many different branches. And at the end of the day, um, and this kind of, you know, speaks to what Matt was talking about. Like at the end of the day, I think a lot of these companies, maybe tech to a lesser degree, but, you know, consumer um, companies like that are traded um, publicly, like the issue is that they're always chasing, um, you know, they're always chasing immediate ROI. And so if, you know, their platform, if you point out compromises in their platform, which makes their platform less, um, sellable, like they don't want, they don't want that. You know? And, and so I think that, you know, when you're working with an organization, it's some, uh, it's an issue that you have to tread around, tread lightly around, um, in that, you know, you, you kind of have to come up with solutions that don't affect the bottom line. If you want to build into a project inclusivity. I find that that's even the case when the project is about inclusivity. Um, you know, you kind of have to highlight what they're doing right and then, um, you know, hope that someone else, especially from the advertising perspective, like, you know, we're not in a role to point out what they're doing wrong. We're just there to highlight what they're doing right. Um, and so, you know, we can build bridges. Uh, but I think that overall, it's really important for us to portray stories where, uh, you know, there's a solution. There's, we're, we're, we want to um, make sure that uh, optimistic futures actually, uh, you know, see the light of day and that there is a counter to the dystopic futures and the dystopic uh, mythologies that are um, seeded in our reality. And in that way, you know, hopefully people can latch on to the optimistic future and start to actually build towards it. Um, and I think that part of that is, um, you know, being optimistic that the technology can be inclusive, that, you know, the engineers will pay attention to bias and work against it. Um, but, you know, and I think that uh, companies are addressing this to varying degrees. Like as an example, um, you know, Google, uh, I think it was Google's platform, which basically was, you know, the machine learning algorithm was conflating black people and um, gorillas. And so in the end, uh, I'm not sure what the latest update is, but, you know, a year into it, they actually weren't able to retrain the model. What they did was they, you know, kind of uh, minimized access to the results of an image search for gorillas. So, you know, there they're not really yeah. fixing the problem. They're just covering it up. On the other hand, IBM has a really interesting initiative, which is called um, AI360. And, you know, I think this is one of the more promising developments that I've seen. Uh, they have a team 
which is basically building an algorithm which looks at the bias of your algorithm. So say you are a mortgage broker, Mm -hmm. which has an automated system that um, pre-approves people for mortgages. Um, you can actually run this other, it's open, um, open source, free software, and you can run your, their AI on top of yours. It'll point out the biases and actually create an algorithm which corrects your bias. And then it's kind of up to you to determine whether or not you want to correct that bias. But I do think that different companies are looking at things differently. And oftentimes it has, you know, the role of PR and the role of the bottom line are not to be, um, you know, overlooked there. I think that does Mm -hmm. play a big role in whether or not a company is, you know, honest and progressive. Yeah. Wow. That's so interesting. That's really, it's fascinating. Um, Thank you. Um, And then Elisa, I'm I'm hoping that you can um, share a little bit about the work that um, Super does, because I feel like you kind of dovetail also into a lot of the things that that Matt was saying. Um, And I'm specifically interested because you help bring new um, perspectives to organizations and stakeholders to the discussions um, th- with the partner with the partner organizations that you work with. It's more of an inclusive conversation, and I'm just wondering if you can explain a little bit about how your organization um, does that. Hmm. Thank you. Um, it's always great if people look at your own website and you can find all those bold claims that you made a year ago. So thank you for, <laughs> for picking up on that. Um, yeah, so this is definitely what we're trying to do. But in this spirit of um, people needing to find their own space, as Matt already said, like, um, like maybe it's not the, the right thing to just put, you know, like inject one person into a system that is um, kind of tuned against them because of existing prejudice. And we think more of um, enabling people to develop their own maybe prototypes or ideas, concepts, and then try to work with them how they can, I don't know, work, work at scale and try to like enhance and, and yeah, enlarge their project. Um, maybe one idea um, or just one example to give on that is um, we had a, a fellowship program, a smaller one before the one that I <laughs> that will start next week. It was called the Future Tech Fellowship. And we had a group of people who develop a um, uh, cycle tracking app for the menstrual cycle. And um, it's built by a diverse group, um, which means that this uh, cycle tracking, cycles tracking app is also trans inclusive. Uh, it doesn't just take fertility into account. Um, you can adjust the color spectrum so you don't get just, you know, pink butterflies and hearts and everything. Um, and this is one thing that needed to be developed out of a business context in a kind of safe space. Um, before it then went public, um, there were a few, I don't know, um, uh, yeah, public outcries, whether this is even needed and everything. And people need to have support in these times. And people uh, need to have a network that supports them and helps them out and is, is with them in these times. And this is more what we try to support. So, yeah, try to lift up projects that are out there, um, make it possible for them to realize their ideas to be shown and talked about and discussed in a way that is that, that feels good and is productive for everyone. And then yeah, the companies um, come to, can come to the table and join the discussion. And I think this is how it should be. Mm, that's great. Oh, I, lo- I love that. Yeah, that's a really um, much more, uh, that's just a different way than, um, and I think just so, so much better. And really thinking about, um, you know, people as, as people, not just, you know, making products. Um, so I just want to remind everyone, all the audience, um, if you guys, we are going to switch to questions somewhat soon so we have enough time because this is only going to go till two. Um, so far, there's one question I'm seeing. So if you, if anyone has questions, please just put it in the Q&A. Um, there might be some questions in the chat too. I'll try to get through those. But um, just to, before we switch off to the audience questions, I just sort of wanted to ask all the panelists. Um, I feel like we could talk about this for so, so long. I mean, this, I feel like it's so, so soon the conversation's um, coming to a close. But um, 
what do you hope that the audience will take away and learn from today's conversation? Like if you, you know, knowing, you know, who you're talking to in the audience and knowing, you know, having all the amazing um, perspectives that you guys do and work in the, in the, in, with the, within the industries that you do and in the ways and the methodologies that you do, it's, it's um, just a really beautiful sort of holistic way to, um, you know, think about things, what would be the, you know, one or two takeaways that you hope the audience will leave with today? Um, does anyone want to go first? I would love to. Um, okay. I think that uh, one big takeaway uh, for me in participating in this um, industry and also in, you know, being an art consumer in the wild, uh, and just also a consumer of information in the wild is that individual actions really can uh, have a massive uh, impact and play a big role in outcomes. Um, I think that in, a, in 2020, we saw 2020 and 2019, um, you know, there were some really significant outcomes from uh, collective action within tech companies and also from artworks that uh, were created and shown widely. Um, I think that as individuals reveal truths that only they have access to, you know, if they are able to build a community around um, amplifying what those truths are and then um, supporting one another in uh, that amplification, um, you know, not only will they reach wider communities, um, they'll also reach the media, they'll reach um, the government, and then they'll also reach stakeholders who, um, you know, within the tech companies who don't want be bad PR stories. And so we've seen, um, you know, things such as, uh, or events such as uh, the major tech companies not selling facial recognition data and their um, models to police enforcement. Um, we've also seen um, attention being given to the Seckler family who were involved in the proliferation of um, oxycodone and oxycodone. Um, and that was in large part amplified by artists uh, who were um, creating happenings within museums. Uh, so I think that there is a huge role which people in the tech industry who are aware of these, um, you know, potential societal harms taking place, I think that they can really, you know, start to question those systems, build community, um, share that information, and uh, build support around making sure that these are equitable platforms. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you. Um, yeah, I would say, well, first of all, I was being, I was told I'd be paid per question and there's not a lot of questions. So first thing you can do is <laughs> ask a question, please. You know, in a Q&A thing, you know what it is. Okay, so, um, but yeah, real talk. I would say if you watch movies, find the movie uh, Coded Bias and watch that. If you read books, um, find the works of Simone Brown, you know and read about um, her, her research, right? Um, and um, Dark Matters is her book, right? And um, follow groups like uh, Algorithmic Justice League and Black and AI, Data for Black Lives, organizations like that. Understand this, you know, like Eliza says, like we, we can solve our own problems. We know what's wrong. And learning to code, psh, we'll figure that out. You know, if technology is what we need to do, directly affected people will solve their own problems. But you put us all together and we're on the margins for a reason. We just don't have those numbers. So we need support. We need advocates. We need people to understand these truths. Challenge your assumptions. Just read the facts. They're very clear, right? Wash some of that cyber blood off your hands and get in and lift and help us lead. So that's, those are my challenges to the, the audience. But hit us with a question. All right, thank you. Um, I'd like to close with uh, maybe two quick observations. Um, one thing that I see, even now in the after aftermath of, of, of the election in the US, that 
we are very quick to propose technological solutions before we've understood the social problem, the underlying problem. And I, I think that um, is something that, that needs to change if you want to have a meaningful step forward in making technology work for everyone. Um, the blockchain won't solve democracy, it won't. Um, people will solve democracy, and I'm, I'm pretty sure about that, that they will, <laughs> if they're given the space and the time to, to work that out. Um, and the other thing is, um, I'm a very privileged person. I'm white, um, I'm from an industrialized country, from Europe. Um, my consume decisions are what the big companies are after. And probably they are also after your consume, uh, like, uh, yeah, decisions, what to buy and what to use. So maybe base those decisions, not whether the tool just works for yourself, but take into account how it will harm other people or not and try to make a difference with these decisions on which tools to use. Great. It's great takeaways, everyone. Thank you. Um, all right, so I'm just gonna jump to some of the questions here. There's one that has a lot of questions. So, you know, it's just get ready. All right, so um, is equity, uh, as equity is an important goal to be strived for in AI, what's this, what is its strict definition by the community? So I think, is equity an important goal to be strived for in AI? Um, what is its uh, strict definition by the community? How are the factors and criteria determined? How is each possibly weighed to achieve a version or universal form of equity? I guess you don't want to source this out, this task to AI. Probably not. Uh, I mean, does I anyone want? Yeah. Yeah, I would just say Matt. this, right? Like, it's proven that, you know, techno solutionism is a problem, right? Like, you know, Eliza said, right? So um, when we think we can have a computer solve the problem to get rid of the bias, to get rid of the bad, to get rid of the issues, it only makes that problem worse. So we see that in policing. We see that, you know, like there was an algorithm to try to help people sort resumes in a fair way. And you teach it, okay, this is what we use for job selection. Well, you're feeding in historic data and those models, that corpus of data is, is plagued with bias and ended up just finding anyone with a woman's name and just tanking that application, right? So yeah, we cannot go to AI to solve it. There's, um, there's a lot of folks out there who are trying to fix these issues. I worked on a project, uh, just like interview about a project. It, it was all Casey Harrod's project called um, Ethical Explorer. If you work in tech, check out Ethical Explorer. It's like, look, we get it, you work in tech, Let's look at ways that we can avoid certain trappings, right? And I had a, a quick interview about like how to avoid surveillance when you're building technology. You're just an engineer, you're just a, a UX researcher, et cetera. Um, we can't act like we're living in a vacuum. We're living in the real world and everything's holistic. Everything's connected. I think COVID teaches us that much. So yeah, we're gonna need human solutions developed by researchers, developed by people who understand the issues of the ground. We have to speak to communities, understand what the harms are. So do a little bit of work, but a little bit of work will avoid horrible situations like the ones we find ourselves in. Yeah, I, I, I think that um, Matt's uh, answer and also uh, the next question, what should the big tech companies do to be more inclusive with their algorithms um, are related to one another in that, uh, so you have the uh, the algorithms that are looking at. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, I'm so sorry. I totally just lost my thought. <laughs> <laughs> Happens to me all the time. Uh, in between connecting the things in these nodes and connecting the AI nodes, I think there is a short. <laughs> no, you're doing great thinking about what tech yeah, companies can do to avoid those algorithms that are biased and. You know, I think that there's an assumption amongst people who don't work in tech, like it's an accident and they don't know what they need to do. Oh no, they know, we've been telling them. You know, like I, I'm lucky in, in, in having worked in tech and being a software engineer and, you know, I get invited and I speak to the staff. I think there's, there's a Google talk that's public of me going to Google talking to folks there. And, you know, we're all banging on the door, screaming at them in private meetings and public meetings and things like that. Now what they do is what they do. 
Why they do it? Well, that's a different story. So is this a mistake? No, it's not a mistake. Is this an accident? I would love to tell you it's an accident. Motivation is real. Why do we do what we do? Why are you not a horrible person? Why did you come and check out this amazing panel that you refuse to ask questions at? You know, like we need, <laughs> to, uh, we need to really ask ourselves like, who are these people that we've given the future to that we believe will solve all the world's problems? Maybe they're not good people, you know? There's some good ones in there, but right. you gotta make points, right? I got my thought back again. So like in relation to that, I think that there, you know, there's the human element of it, which is like, what's the intention of the person who's programming the algorithm or who's, you know, deciding like what they want the thing to do. But I also think that there's an engineering problem here that needs to be solved. And maybe this can, you know, kind of um, present a new problem, a new technical problem for the folks out there who are watching this, which is that like a lot of the algorithms that are being built right now are black boxes. And so that's inefficient for a number of reasons. Um, but that's where a lot of the empiricism can come back into play. It's also a highly inefficient system in terms of, let's say, like, um, you know, the reuse of these algorithms, the, the tweaking of the algorithm to get it to be just right. Like if it's a black box, you don't have that possibility. And so I think that in terms of the engineering problem that, you know, we have on our hands, like how do we actually build models that are transparent where we can see mm -hmm. how the decisions are being made and then we can adjust those as opposed to saying like, you know, I put these inputs into the box. This is the algorithm that comes out. It's kind of good enough. It's the best one that I got out of the, you know, thousand that I ran. I'm going to go with it. Like there should be a way in the future where we can, you know, tweak that one part of the algorithm using our human curation. We're like, that's wrong. That's where it picked up on pre-existing biases. And we need to account for that in the future because as we move forward, the AI will also be in charge of using the existing models and iterating upon them, building new AI. And so this is the right time to solve the problems for biases, historical biases in the data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great point. Go can ahead, I just one quick, quick thought to, for the last question, how can we pressure big companies to do that? And there's actually a great example how big tech companies were pressured into something. It's public procurement. There's lots of money in public procurement. And for example, in the United States, there are really high standards towards accessibility. Um, products must be accessible to people with disabilities to be considered uh, in public procurement. And this is why many digital tools are actually doing quite well if they are aimed at that sector. So what we need, like just have standards, have audits that need to be fulfilled, transparency criteria, and the tech companies will go after that money and they will comply it, at least to some degree. And I think that's a good way to start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that, you know, parent companies, people who are employing these technologies respond to threats to their bottom line. And so, you know, in, in the United States or, um, you know, one of my clients was the New York Times. And if we would build an app that somehow was a breach of GDPR because we were also allowing this platform to be used in Europe, then that had the threat of like single digit percentages, but of like the net value of the New York Times. So, you know, like they responded to that. Like we implemented policies which were even more strict than GDPR across platforms that we built. And so, you know, if you could put the same type of threat uh, or build that into machine learning for bias, like imagine, you know, the impact that you could have. So that's, you know, really a regulation issue and comes down to public awareness and like what we're able to hold our representatives accountable for. This is great. This is such good. I'm so glad we're recording this because then we can just, you know, share it with so many people. And I mean, thank you so much to the audience um, who has been with us and, and, and heard this conversation live. And thank you for, um, thank you for the folks asking questions. Um, we appreciate it. Even if you're shy, that's okay. Um, uh, so, I mean, we, we just covered so many different, so many topics, you know, and I, and I think, um, 
what I really love about this panel is that everyone has given such an amazing perspective from from a different perspective and from a different um, like sector and working in a different way. And um, I really hope this has been, you know, it's just the beginning. I mean, it's just scratching the surfaces of the things that we really need to be um, digging into and, and thinking about with these technologies and and the urgency behind, behind that. Um, and it's quite urgent now because things are going very, very fast. Um, you know, and as Matt said, we know what the problems are and they need to be, you know, changed. And um, the U.S. is behind on, on creating rules and, um, you know, safeguards for a lot of communities. So, um, yeah, it's, you know, it's a, it's a big problem. And, you know, globally, we have a very long way to go. So um, we uh, thank you guys so much. Um, that's all the time that we have, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, so please, let, we'll send a follow-up email to everyone who uh, participated and um, we'll let you know when the, the video discussion is um, online. And, um, you know, always feel free to share it, you know, revisit the conversation. I think this is such a good one with such great nuggets um, of information. And um, hopefully we can put the links that are in the chat in that email too, I don't know. Um, but, uh, hopefully, yeah. Uh, and, uh, so our next node session will happen on December 10th and you can find details on that, um, on the website, uh, get on the grid and, uh, on the Guta Institute's website and social media page. So, um, on behalf of Weena, Eliza, Matt, uh, and as well as the team at the Guta Institute, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Uh, and participate in our discussion. Uh, my name is Marnie Benny and have a great rest of your day.